Good afternoon. So, the conference on India Japan 70 uh, years of relationship. Um, now, now, we will uh, have we'll start the session five civilization and people to people ties. Um, we have uh, an excellent panel of speakers to deliberate on the subject. Um, the session will be chaired by Mr. Kodi Sato, Director General of Japan Foundation. Um, Unfortunately, Professor Masaki won't be able to join uh, because of health, family health emergency. Um, the other speakers we have are Professor Pierre George, Professor of Japanese Studies, Development University, uh, Professor Benjamin Kopadia, uh, Professor of Department of Institution Studies, uh, Delhi University. Um, before handing over the floor um, to the chair, um, allow me to introduce. Uh, Chair Mr. Koji Sato. Uh, Mr. Koji Sato is the current Director General of the Japan Foundation in Delhi. He has taken up this position in January 2021. And this is his second assignment at the Japan Foundation in Delhi. He joined the Japan Foundation in 1995. And prior to the current assignment, he has served at the overseas office of the Japan Foundation in Cairo. Egypt, Cairo, Egypt, uh, Yangon, Myanmar, besides New Delhi. At the foundation's headquarters, he has been assigned at the Asia Center as director, while also having served at various other departments as foundation. He is an alumnus of the School of Law, Hokkaido University. Koji san, uh, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Georgin. <clears throat> And uh, thank you very, very much, uh, IWCA, for having me an opportunity to join in this uh, wonderful webinar commemorating the 70th anniversary of Japan-India diplomatic relations. And uh, I'm very appreciate uh, to the organizer just to make uh, one unique session other than the you know, previous ones, uh, focusing on uh, culture, or maybe uh, exchange on a grassroots or people to people level. Uh, when we talk about the bilateral relations, uh, mainly maybe we focus on the diplomacy or uh, political issues or security or economic cooperation. Uh, of course, you know, they are the uh, key issues to be discussed. But uh, at the same time, it is quite important to uh, highlight and discuss uh, about the uh, trust and shared value among the people and uh, just how we uh, perceive and uh, promote the exchange uh, or mutual understandings between the people of the two countries. I think just, you know, uh, these maybe two wheels just, you know, will move together and then only maybe the national level of uh, uh, cooperation just will uh, develop just <clears throat> in a good manner. So in this session, uh, on the title of civilization on people to people ties, uh, we uh, invite, the, uh, actually we invite the three prominent uh, specialists or scholars, uh, on this topic, uh, but uh, unfortunately, just uh, <clears throat> as informed as as announced, uh, we are now missing the uh, Professor Fukunaga from Japan. So, uh, just uh, my old friends, just uh, from the uh, JNU and Delhi University, just uh, we welcome the Professor P. A. George from JNU and uh, Dr. Professor Ranjanam Kupatia from Delhi University. <clears throat> so. Uh, Maybe uh, when we uh, learn about the uh, whole long history of uh, the exchange or ties between Japan and India, uh, it starts with the <clears throat> maybe seventh century or six or seventh century, just when the Buddhism just came into Japan via China. <clears throat> and uh, in the eighth century, uh, of course, just uh, the, the uh, Bodhisena just came to Japan and uh, uh, 
celebrated the eye open ceremony of Todaiji. But since then, just as the uh, Buddhism just uh, receded in India, maybe a very long silence was there just between the two countries. And only after maybe the, <clears throat> the world entering into the modern period, uh, maybe some uh, uh, very phenomenal exchange of the great souls of the two countries like Swami Vivekananda, Srinath Tagore, or Kakura Kenshin and Yokona Taika and so on. So just, you know, these souls just merge together and uh, uh, exchange the very deep uh, idea and thoughts. And that ha had become the kind of quite a big basis of the maybe uh, mutual understanding or trust between the two nations. <clears throat> uh, but once again, just uh, maybe there was a, uh, conflict and war period in between. And uh, maybe after the war, just there are quite a, a popular story that just uh, have been shared in the previous session also. <clears throat> but uh, just one uh, question is that just, uh, is there any uh, kind of a persisting, uh, you know, shared values <clears throat> that is the basis of the you know, kind of a positive public perception of these two countries. Uh, you know, although there are some, you know, uh, uh, some missing points in the uh, long history of time, what is the kind of a, a shared ethos <clears throat> uh, as an Asians or whatever, just between our two countries? Or uh, maybe previously, uh, maybe the, all those uh, physical exchange or dialogue were limited to the very you know, uh, uh, number of quite a small number of people. But uh, now just uh, the uh, actual contact of the people has been expanded to the wider public. So in due course, just uh, how the mutual perception of these two countries or nations have been changed or in developed. So such kind of debate or discussion uh, has maybe seldom uh, been done so far. So although the time is very limited, but they're using this occasion, uh, thanks, for, thanks to the organizer, uh, just we like to uh, pursue this topic and theme and uh, maybe enjoy the discussion. <clears throat> so, uh, we expected that uh, Professor Funaga maybe to make a kind of a sort of a keynote uh, presentation titled, titled The Historical Development of Japan Indian Civilization and People to People Relationship. So it is a very missing and pity, but uh, maybe uh, let me uh, invite uh, uh, Professor P.A. George, uh, Professor of Japanese Studies, School of Language and Cultural Studies, JNU, uh, to make a presentation on the title of uh, 70 years of Japanese studies in India and appraisal. So before asking him to uh, start the presentation, uh, let me quickly introduce the George Sensei. Uh, so George Sensei is a professor of J uh, Japanese language and literature, and he's a chairperson of the Center for Japanese Studies, School of Language, Literature and Cultural Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has done ex extensive research in modern Japanese literature, especially on Shimazaki Toson, Miyazawa Kenji, and Ishikawa Takuboku. And Dr. George is also a known translator of Japanese literature into his, his mother tongue, Marayaram, and also Indian English. And he is a recipient of many prestigious awards. Uh, including the Miyazawa uh, Kenji Shoraisho Award by um, Hanamaki City Government in 2002. So, floor is open to you, George Sensei. Thank you, Sato san. Uh, first of all, at the outset, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Jojin and uh, his organization, ICWA, for organizing such a wonderful uh, international seminar. 
uh, on the occasion of 70th uh, anniversary of uh, our diplomatic relations with Japan. <clears throat> Actually, as uh, uh, the chair has already introduced me, uh, my specialization is the Japanese language and literature studies. But today, you know, the preceding sessions we have listen to many outstanding papers by scholars or regional studies or area studies of Japan. And uh, my paper, I am not going to present any uh, paper on literature. Instead, uh, I would like to present a, paper, a report type paper on the state of Japanese studies at present in India. Uh, so it is more or less a report, not a uh, research paper. So please uh, bear with me for that. Uh, now, since we are allowed, given only 15 to 20 minutes, uh, I may have to... Yeah, sorry. Just one minute, let me... Uh, so, you, normally when we talk about Indo-Japan relations, uh, cultural as well as economic and uh, uh, trade relations or strategic relations, uh, normally we start with the, uh, like Sato San already mentioned, the relationship which we had uh, right from the 6th or 7th century, uh, uh, along with the introduction of Buddhism to Japan. but However, I feel that that was only a one-way uh, traffic. Uh, the Buddhism went to Japan through China from India, but Indians, you know, actually not very familiar with the existence of even Japan those days. So the actual uh, diplomatic relations or the people-to-people -people relations started only after the beginning of uh, 20th century, maybe perhaps after Russo-Japan. Uh, war, uh, many Indians used to visit in Japan for learning many things like uh, the <clears throat> industrial development there or the agricultural uh, process uh, being implemented there in Japan in the early centuries of uh, early decades of 20th century. However, the actual, in my opinion, the actual two way interaction started only after 1952 after we signed the the diplomatic relations after the war in 1952. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was an Indo-Japan cultural exchange agreement which was signed in 1956. Uh, but in India, we have started uh, a department of uh, 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 international school for, uh, sorry, a school for international studies in Japan, in India. Uh, that was known as Indian School of International Studies, established in 1954, where there was a uh, you know, department for East Asian Studies, Department of East Asian Studies, mainly Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Now, this was in 1954. However, when, uh, when JNU was established in 1969, Joey uh, Sensei, Joey Sensei, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, maybe the uh, uh, slide is a little bit uh, hard to see. Maybe could you press the from let beginning me, button and uh, make uh, make it wider? Yeah, let me let me see. I think you should put the full um, the full screen. Yeah, it's in full screen only. Uh, take it to I the view. Know. It's it's in slideshow. Is it okay now? No, it is half only we can see. I see, just uh, let me. Mm. Uh, should I go then without slideshow from like this? Is it uh, visible? Uh, this is visible, this is better. Okay, okay, so I'll go like this. Uh, so, uh, my opinion, actual 
uh, interaction started only after 1952. And Japanese studies started in India in 1954. In fact, two years before, uh, two years after we signed the uh, diplomatic, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, started the uh, diplomatic relations with Japan after the war. So uh, Japanese studies in India has got a history of 68 years now. Uh, the uh, diplomatic relation has got 70 years, but uh, uh, Japanese studies has uh, 68 years, which is much uh, longer and older than even China, Korea, where the uh, uh, Japanese studies started only in the late 70s and 80s, 1970s and 80s. Now, today's my uh, presentation, actually, I wanted to uh, uh, present uh, slightly elaborately in three parts. However, because of the shortage of time, uh, the first part, which I thought that I would introduce, uh, the pioneers of Japanese studies in India, which I will, I'm going to skip now. In part two, I would like to introduce briefly the state of Japanese studies, Japanese language teaching in three central universities, uh, namely JNU, DU, and Vishwaradi, because only these three universities in India are at present offering uh, programs on Japanese studies. Finally, in part three, some of the present problems and future prospects of Japanese studies in India will be addressed uh, briefly. Uh, now, I will skip all these things. Uh, these are some important uh, events took place uh, in uh, after 1952. Of course, the diplomatic relations started in 1952, then establishment of Indian School of International Studies, where Japanese studies was uh, started in 1954. Then signing of uh, Indo-Japan Cultural Exchange Agreement in 1956. Then uh, New Delhi, Embassy of Japan started uh, a program, course on Japanese language, also simultaneously in Kolkata Consulate uh, in 1958. And uh, in 1969, a uh, exchange of a memorandum on promotion of Japanese studies in India was signed. And that was the turning point one of the major turning point uh, in India as far as Japanese studies is concerned. Uh, then, uh, of course, after that, uh, Delhi University starting Japanese studies in 1969 and JNU starting uh, Japanese studies in 1969. Uh, of course, the program started in 1971. Uh, so part one, I am skipping. Now, uh, before going to the second part, uh, I would like to briefly mention about the uh, situation, the status of Japanese language teaching and learning in India now. Because uh, there was a spot of search in the, the number of learners, Japanese learners in India after 1990s, uh, because of various uh, reasons, as all of us know, opening of the market and then uh, you know, uh, there was actually 2000 onwards in the previous papers, everybody has mentioned about the, uh, the strategic relations India and Japan, you know, uh, began uh, after uh, Prime Minister Moji's visit to India in 2000. Uh, so all these things we know, and because, and of course, number of uh, uh, institu sorry, Japanese companies in India also increased and the demand for Japanese knowing persons in India increased uh, after 1990s. Uh, and uh, now, as on now, of course, we have the data of uh, 19, uh, 2018 only, which was published by Japan Foundation, where you know, uh, around 38,000 uh, Indians are learning Japanese in India. However, now I think after that four years of, uh, passed, so maybe around 40, 45,000, the data exactly is not available, so I am not able to give the exact number. Similarly, number of uh, uh, teachers and institutes also uh, increased, Japanese language institute. This I am, uh, why I am presenting or uh, uh, showing this data here because I, I, later on, I will I will be briefly comparing the uh, growth of Japanese language learning in India and the stagnated position uh, situation of uh, Japanese studies in India. Okay, now this is part two, person state of Japanese studies in India. 
as I have already uh, mentioned, 68 years of uh, history uh, is there as far as the Japanese studies in India is concerned. Uh, however, uh, when we compare it with the, with the growth of Japanese language in India, growth of Japanese studies not that uh, you know impressive. It in fact uh, uh, is stagnant in a stagnant position situation even now. So this may have to be taken care of by the governments and the uh, concerned institutes or uh, think tanks. You know what all we have to take care of because as far as I'm concerned uh, any any bilateral relationship uh, could be possible smoothly only if we know the culture, the, the, the philosophical thinking, the worldview of the people of the other country properly. And for that, you need more uh, experts on Japanese studies or Japanese language uh, or culture studies. So that is why I emphasize this point. Now, Japanese studies in Diu. Delhi University had already started Chinese studies in 1964. However, uh, after the uh, exchange of a mem memorandum on promotion of Japanese studies in India uh, in October 1969, uh, Delhi University soon after that started Japanese program, introduced Japanese program, Japanese area study program, as well as Japanese language uh, teaching. Uh, now, Delhi University Center, the Department of East Asian Studies have got Japanese area regional studies, Japanese literature and culture studies, and Japanese language, uh, all in the same department. Now, that is a, a characteristic uh, speciality of DU, that both the area studies and culture, literature studies, and language are uh, done in the same center. Uh, now, regarding the major courses uh, DAS is offering in Delhi University, you know, in, as far as language is concerned, diploma course, advanced diploma course, intensive diploma course, so on and so on. And then they have a very well uh, uh, structured MA program in literature and culture. And also they have a MA program in East Asian studies, which is also very popular among uh, people uh, not only those who have basic knowledge of East Asian countries, but also uh, other uh, students from other field of studies. Uh, and then in PhD program, they have PhD in area studies, regional studies, and also literature, culture studies, and Buddhist studies. Now, DAS had uh, both MPhil and PhD programs till 19, uh, 2014. After that, they have discontinued MPhil program. Only PhD program is there. And uh, uh, as far as the MPhil programs concerned, when it was there, the major topics of uh, uh, research was the Japanese politics, economic, trade, foreign policy, society, and culture. And then major field of research as far as PhD is concerned, Japan's nuclear disarmament, approach, uh, disarmament approaches, foreign policy, defense policy, international relations, Japanese economics, politics, history, literature, and Buddhism. Now, history I have added, there are not many scholars as far as Japanese history is concerned, but there's only one PhD so far uh, completed in uh, DU as far as history is concerned. This, this will be taken, uh, you know, I will be giving the data later more clearly. Uh, so far, DU has uh, awarded 14 PhDs from 1969 to 2020. So now this itself shows, uh, although we started the Japanese studies program DU in 1969, over the years, only 14 PhDs. So it's very, very mega, very little, very little. Now, why is it happening like that? that we have to think about. All those scholars of Japanese studies and also governments, they should think about this. Why only 14 students have completed PhD in BU over uh, 68 years, or oh, 60 years, almost 60 years, not 68 BU. Okay. And then uh, major, uh, out of these 14 PhDs, the major 
topics, research topics are Japanese international relations, politics, economics, sociology, history, two are there, not one, two are there, and literature too. These are the major research field. Now, here, one thing we have to take note of is that the Japanese soft culture, Japanese traditional culture, culture Japanese religion, and many other things which are very important uh, field of uh, study uh, not taken for research in Delhi University. So this itself is uh, something which uh, needs to be corrected, to be promoted uh, hereafter, research in various other fields related to Japan, uh, ignored so far. And then uh, as far as uh, MPhil is concerned, MPhil was discontinued in 2014, and the last MPhils were submitted, degree was, was submit, uh, awarded in 2015. And total number of MPhil, MPhil degrees BU awarded uh, from 1972 to 2015 uh, uh, is only 60, 60 MPhil degrees. And again, in MPhil also, the major topics of, of field of specialization uh, are Japan's international relations, politics, etc. There is nothing uh, about religion. Or religion, of course, a little bit is there, but culture, traditional culture of Japan, very few, only one. And then uh, soft culture, nobody is taking up recently. Soft culture has become one of the major field of uh, research in uh, Europe and America. But in India, nobody is taking it up. So this uh, finding I had in the uh, in my during my uh, writing this paper. Uh, now coming to JNU, JNU has got two departments: uh, Japanese Studies Department. One is actually the Center for East Asian Studies in SAS School of International Studies. Uh, this Center for East Asian Studies has actually a, a department of School of International Studies. Uh, uh, established in 1954. So, uh, and also we have Japanese studies in School of Language, Literature and Culture Studies, uh, where, uh, you know, we, you know, offer courses from BA to PhD level. Uh, now, Japanese studies in CIS. Uh, the Japanese area regional studies program in CIS has been you know, you know, offering like the university, MPhil and PhD programs over the years uh, on diverse aspects of Japan, namely Japan's foreign policy, international relations, nuclear disarmament, defense policy, economic cooperation, etc., etc. Again, JNU also fields such as Japanese religion, anthropology, soft culture, history, etc., have not at, emerged very popular among the area studies scholars. So this is one of the drawback even in JNU. However, JNU has uh, awarded 47 PhDs from 1980 to 2021. And uh, you, uh, you, although JNU research started, uh, the CA started from 1971, the first PhD was completed only in 1980. And that was none but Professor Saudi Rishon. She was the first PhD from JNU. And of course, if you take first PhD in Japanese studies in India, it was Professor Pan Murthy, PA Nelson Murthy. He completed his PhD from School of International Studies, Indian School of International Studies, which was established in 1950. And then after that, three of two or three more, like Professor K. V. Kashan also got his PhD from school, Indian School of International Studies. So otherwise, only 47 PhDs. And even in JNU, these uh, major field of inter, uh, research are all uh, either related to international relations or economy or uh, economics or uh, sociology and then politics. Otherwise, all other subjects are uh, nearly uh, overlooked or ignored. And as far as uh, uh, the major research topics of PhD, already I have mentioned, but uh, if you go a little bit in deep, then uh, it is like this, that uh, Japan's relation with, relations with other countries, political trade, investment, and maritime security issues, et cetera, et cetera. 
えー、っと、JNU has、uh, CAS has awarded 148 MPhils from 1972 to 2018. Again, the field of research fields are almost identical with PhD, not much difference.、Uh, like history, religion, soft、uh, culture, all these fields are ignored. Uh, the present state of CAS, that is also very important to、uh, you know, inform because、uh, we are actually painful to see the situation in the center. Well, there is only one professor, Professor Shawani, and、uh, she, have, she has to、uh, you know, guide、uh, more than 17 students even now because. There are three posts lying vacant for years, decades, which are not filled. So, this also shows the importance, how, how much importance we give to Japanese studies. Whereas, if you take Chinese and Korean studies in the same center, they have more than three to four faculties each. And whenever a post falls vacant, immediately it is filled. So, this is, these are things to be comparatively looked upon and then、uh, taken for、uh, remedial. Measures by the governments and you know, concerned authorities. Now, coming to the next one, we have a little bit of 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 a Uh, actually, PhD started only in MPhil, PhD started only in 2006, but we had a pre PhD and PhD program from 1982 and awarded so, you know, eight PhDs uh, so far uh, literature six, linguistics two. And then MPhil, we have also MPhil program. Our MPhil program also discontinued. And now,、uh, you know, we from 2006 to 2021, we awarded 23. The MPhils there in uh, CJS. Uh, most of them are on, on Japanese literature, society, language, and linguistics, etc. Et、uh, mainly in the culture studies.、Uh, then comes to uh, 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 Vishwavarati, because I have to mention about that also. Vishwavarati started a PhD program in 2011, MA program in 2008, and they have so far, you know. There, theirs is mainly cultural studies, literature and cultural studies. There is no area study research in、uh, Vishwavarati, and they have awarded so far three PhDs. And there are, of course, many other universities where they have ML,、uh, Japanese language course till the MA level, but uh, not uh, any research programs. So I am not taking it up. Now, some major problems. Major problems, there are many major problems.、Uh, you know, actually, I will be writing this in my paper because of shortage of time. Maybe, you know,、uh, very one or two problems I can mention. First thing is that,、uh, as I mentioned earlier,、uh, the, the posts are lying vacant and there is few to teachers、uh, to guide the、uh, PhD students. That, that's one thing. Second is that、uh, all those good students who are、uh, good at Japanese language. They don't join for research. They, you know, what they do is they just, uh, uh, after graduating, join some corporate sector and、uh, don't come back to research program. So, this is another、uh, what is a painful situation we are facing. Good students are not remaining for research. And of course,、uh, in the future, I think、uh, there are many. Many people who are interested in Japanese soft culture like manga, J pop, etc. So, the young generation hereafter might show more、uh, interest in learning Japanese language as well as doing research in Japanese studies, but they need to be given、uh, proper encouragement and guidance. So, this has to be taken care of. And with this, I'm sorry, I, I think、uh, taken、uh, extra time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Joyce, Joyce, thank you very much. So、uh, I, I understood that uh, uh, 
Professor George's presentation is uh, maybe uh, rather the, uh, you know, touching upon the issues of the uh, situation of the institution just that maybe produce the uh, future intellectuals that may, that will lead, you know, the uh, bilateral uh, friendship and ties and communication. So uh, it is a kind of, as, as he said, it is a kind of painful report, but uh, as you see just, you know, in this uh, webinar, uh, there are uh, most of the, most of the panelists just are from the, those, those institutions of Japanese studies. So that clearly shows that, uh, uh, you know, how important uh, that the sustainability of or development of these institutions should be secured. And also, uh, maybe uh, uh, George Sensei touched upon the uh, strong needs, maybe to uh, to widen the scope of the uh, Japanese studies, so that uh, uh, maybe view on you know uh, seeing the Japan, actual Japan, uh, should be maybe uh, multifaceted, uh, and uh, uh, so by the uh, more active, um, active uh, activities of those scholars by maybe writing theses or articles or maybe translation and so on. Maybe, you know, uh, good or real image of Japan this should be uh, shared by the wider public. So in this sense, uh, the highlighting and strengthening the uh, institution of these Japanese studies are quite important. So maybe how to do it, maybe could be, uh, if time allows, maybe discuss in a further, uh, further time. So now just uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Professor Ranjana Mukhopadhyaya uh, of the Delhi University. Uh, maybe there's no need for the uh, uh, further uh, introduction, but uh, Ranjana Sensei is a professor of Japanese studies in the Department of East Asian Studies. University of Delhi. She has also taught in Nagoya City University and was the visiting faculty in International Christian University and Chukyu University in Japan. Uh, she's the author of a number of books and articles in English as well as in Japanese on Japanese religion, Buddhism, and East Asian society and culture. Uh, also a recipient of uh, two prestigious academic awards in Japan uh, related to the religious, her religious studies. So, uh, based on the uh, very vast knowledge of the uh, Buddhism studies, uh, so please uh, share the, your idea or uh, knowledge about the, uh, from pilgrimage to diplomacy, Buddhism in India, Japan, relations. It's always open to you, Ranjan Sensei. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. S um, Sato. I'm, um, I'm really uh, grateful that you're chairing this session. And um, first, I'd like to thank uh, ICWA and especially John. Like, it is, it's been a wonderful conference. I've been hearing some of the papers since morning, and I really enjoyed it. And my special gratitude to Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh um, for uh, inviting me for this conference. Uh, okay, so my topic is, um, I'll share the screen. Oh, why is it this like this? Okay. Okay. So my uh, topic is on uh, Buddhism in India-Japan relations. Now, um, uh, we are now, um, it, this is uh, 70 years of India Japan relations, but if you see from a Buddhist perspective, it is just one page because Buddhism has been for a very, it's the history of uh, uh, relationship through Buddhism has been so long. 
so um in this uh, uh, thing i think uh, buddhism is one of the most enduring uh, and important spiritual cultural and intellectual relation between india and japan and um, india has always been a place of reverence by virtue of being the birthplace of of uh, buddhism and it has been referred to as tenjuku or seten which means western paradise in the buddhist scriptures but here i in this paper i would like to see how the dynamics of the relationship has actually changed uh, even if it's the same buddhist if we look even from the perspective of buddhism in the every age there has been a different dynamic uh, of uh, the relationship between india and japan through buddhism and that is uh, my whole uh, focus of uh, the paper and as you know this is uh, bodhisena which is a very celebrated aspect of the relationship between um, uh, the india and, and japan and i think every any as, as uh, ambassador who who i've heard they've always referred to bodhisena in their speeches and including the uh, abe and or even the emperor emeritus when he came to to india in 2014 he was actually referring to bodhisena in his speech uh, so uh, i mean our whole but uh, the books about bodhisena much later i mean there is this chronicle of uh, supplementary chronicle of japan which says the bodhisena came to japan in 1936 along with two other buddhist priest and then you have uh, todai ji um, uh, yoroku uh, yoroku which says that he was the person who oversaw the ayukning ceremony um, of the great buddha in todai ji in 752 ad which was and it's very specific about the date it says 9th of april in 752 ad and also the brush it is said the brush which is which he used uh, is still there in the storehouse um, of todai ji and it is a na national treasure so from this uh, what we go is that um, the whole uh, persona of uh, Bodh uh, bodhisena is why is it very important is that because he he is one of the person who's actually establishing a direct link between buddhism in japan and this place of origin that is um, um, uh, that is india and also what uh, this besides transfer of uh, scriptures with the scriptures th uh, this presence of bodhisena or the uh, or the transfer of scriptures they help create an imagination of india in the in the mind of the japanese people um, and so uh, what happens in that in heian period believe in uh, jodo or the pure land becomes a very popular buddhist belief and most people start associating um, uh, tenj um, uh, india that is tenjuku with uh, uh, pure land and they they in fact there this saiho jodo or the western paradise the work concept comes up and but uh, uh, despite uh, at that time many people were not sure whether it is a, a real uh, really a country like india exists or is just a fictional thing so there was a great excitement or great longing among the japanese people to actually travel to india and see, and go and see india uh, go on a pilgrimage so one of the earliest instances that we know is about prince uh, takako shinno who was the son of emperor heizei uh, who became a monk and he went to china and but then from china he sets off to go towards uh, india but he somewhere lost in um, in the southern end of uh, malay which is now the singapore and in fact singapore there are temples or there are organizations which are dedicated to this prince takao shinmi and uh, then in uh, kamakura period we find that there were unsuccessful attempts by asi who is the founder of the rinzai sect of uh, zen buddhism in japan he goes to china and from china he is trying and he is making an attempt to go to japan but he is not able to go then there is this uh, moe who is a monk of the kegon sect of uh, buddhism he very meticulously makes a journal which is called journal on the distance to uh, to tang um, great tang in india and uh, to, to and in this he 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 uh, he actually calculates the distance between from japan to uh, uh, tang that is china and from china to uh, india taking into account the season the topography the the geography everything but he doesn't uh, go on this um, journey because he goes to worship in a shrine and he gets a vision or he gets a, um, he has a vision that the uh, the deities are telling him not to take this journey so he doesn't go on this journey
But then you have uh, people like Kitabata Kechika Fusa, who is a noble quote writer, and he writes extensively about Tenjuku you know, in Jinno Shotoku, which is actually a uh, writing about uh, tracing the imperial line. But he's actually referring a great deal to, uh, and it is a Shinto text, but even there, uh, Tenjuku is being uh, referred to. And um, so from there now, so this was happening in this um, Tokugawa period. And so all these attempts to go to uh, come to India were unsuccessful or they never materialized. So, but in the um, Tokugawa period, we have one person, he's Tenjuku uh, Tokube, and um, who is who was a trader, um, and he got employed um, uh, as a trade with a trading company in Kyoto, and through there from there he goes on voyages to Vietnam and Siam, and he says that he has been to uh, India. He says I've gone where the source of Ganga is in his book, and he say, he writes about the Magadha Kingdom. Now it is highly uh, doubtful whether he went or not, but then he's a very celebrated person in uh, um, uh, in uh, Kabuki, and he's actually his his persona. He's he's a Kabuki character also, and the photograph that is here is is him in a Kabuki character, and he, he takes up this nickname as Tenjuku for himself, and he writes this book Tenjuku Tokai Monogatari, a story of journey crossing over to crossing the ocean to India. Then uh, there is the Shimano Kenryo, who was a Dutch interpreter in Nagasaki, and he said that he has visited um, uh, Gyo Osha, that is, he has gone to Savasti, but actually he goes still Angkor Wat. And in those times, most people, they would consider, they would think Angkor Wat was, uh, or in Cambodia, was actually India, and they would actually mistake that for uh, Tenjuku. Um, so the, but then you have Hirata Atsutani, who is a Shinto uh, 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 writer, who is a, um, and he's very critical of Buddhism, and he's a nationalist writer. But even he writes a book on history of Indian collection, uh, Indo Joshi, where he's criticizing India and he's saying it's just a custom of uh, Indian culture and there's no need for uh, uh, Japanese to follow it because he's a nativist, he's a Kokugaksha. If, um, so uh, and uh, so so by this time when Japan it, it was the end of Tokugawa period, actually you have a first time when a book has been write, written as Indo. I mean there are other books, but uh, before that it was all, always referred to as Tenjuku. So gradually uh, we are coming to closer to much more realistic India. So, but actually till here, we find that there is hardly any physical contact between India and Japan. I mean, it's very sparing contact, which is very amazing. And between these two countries, till the Meiji restoration, there's actually no contact between, there's no people to people contact. So the first is of course Shimaji Mukurai. He was he had gone to Europe of within the Iwakura mission, and he was a Buddhist uh, priest of Pure Land School. So when he came back to Japan, on his way back to Japan, he stopped in India. But it's very it's interesting that he doesn't he didn't go to any of the Buddhist sites. From Bombay he went to Calcutta, and then from there he took the ship. He passed through uh, Budhgaya. He didn't stop there. So in even the, at that time in Buddhist imagination of the Japanese Buddhists, they were not aware of the places or they had not located the places. Then, of course, you have Kitaba Batake Doryo, who is the first Japanese um, uh, to, uh, to visit Budhgaya. And in 1883, he comes to uh, Budhgaya and he writes uh, quite a few. Um, uh, but when he visits Budhgaya, he sees the Mahabodhi temple and he thinks, which is being excavated at the time. So he thinks it's the tomb of, uh, of uh, Shakamuni Buddha. So he writes this about um, uh, this uh, uh, travel diary of World to the history of Shakamuni's tomb. Then he writes another book, is, which is about his travel diary. So, and Tenjuku Kolu Shuken. And so these are all, this is actually first hand account. So, for the first time in after the Meiji Restoration, we are actually getting first hand account of India by Japanese. Um, so, and which are actually coming from Buddhist uh, travelers. So, of course, uh, then uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, for in Meiji Restoration when it came, um, it was actually very damaging for most um, Buddhist, uh, uh, for Japanese Buddhism, because what happened towards the end of Meiji Restoration, towards the end of, towards the beginning of Meiji Restoration was Haibutsu Kishaku. That is, there was widespread persecution of, of Buddhists, of Buddhism. Buddhists were seen as foreign, uh, Buddhists were, Buddhism was seen as a foreign religion. They were seen as social, monks were to, seen as uh, social burdens, unproductive people. So all these, um, uh, 
uh, uh, Buddhist scholars and intellectuals, they felt that it was a need to actually reestablish it, so to rediscover themselves. Hello? And for this, they started. Uh, ah. Sorry, for this. But please this, unmute, please. Ah, gaya. Sorry. Unmute, unmute, please. Are aapke wahas kal aapi aaye the kya? Doctor Titli, please unmute yourself. Mute yourself. And unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, then we have uh, people like uh, uh, Takakusa uh, Taka um, Junjiro Ka, Kasahara Kenji, and also um, this uh, uh, Inubunyo. And um, uh, they all are now going to um, uh, uh, this uh, Western countries to study Buddhism. Now, this becomes a very landmark event in the, in the history of uh, um, the, uh, so Buddhism in Japan, because for the first time, they're studying Indian philosophy, Buddhism, and Sanskrit. So they're getting out of the Sinocentricism of uh, Buddhism. So till then, all the sources of Buddhism in Japan were Chinese sources. So gradually, when they are going and studying in London, they're studying under people like Max Muller, who is a Buddhist, Indian Buddhist. Uh, he's worked on Indian philosophy, Buddhism, and Sanskrit. So, uh, so uh, this uh, Nanjo Bunyo, he goes back and writes a book on Sanskrit. Uh, on, on, he's a linguist. He writes a book on Sanskrit. So then later on, you have this Inoue Enrio. He's also visiting India. But these are the people who are actually um, coming to um, India via Europe. I mean, they've gone to Europe, they studied in Europe, and then they're mm -hmm. coming to India. So basically, they are coming into that Orientalist mode. So their understanding of Indian Buddhism is also through the eyes of Western scholars. So the, so this is initially, but that is what, uh, but then this is also very important because they're, they're getting out of the Chinese Sinocentricism. Then also you have people like Kawaguchi Ekai, Tada Tokan, um, Nomi Yukata, or Teramoto Inga, who, get, who are studying esoteric Buddhism. So they have great uh, interest in Tibetan Buddhism. Now to get to, to Tibet, they're coming to India. And at that time, the, for Japanese to, get it, to go into Tibet was through Darjeeling. It was not even through Lhasa, it was more through Darjeeling. People would go to Darjeeling and from, and, which is now Arunachal Pradesh, and then they would cross over to Tibet. So these people were coming to Tibet. And so uh, there was another new uh, exposure that they were getting. So uh, what was, uh, and then you have a bigger uh, thing, which was the o o Otani expedition, which was uh, um, led by Otani Kosui. He was an abbot of the Nishihonganji branch of uh, Pure Land Buddhism. And they actually, it is the first time they actually go out on an excavation. They do excavation and exploration. Mm, of, um, and, uh, and after traveling through all the area, they survey, they're the people who are coming and surveying the sites in India. So for uh, what is gradually happening now is that no longer um, India is a Tenjuku. For them, they're seeing state of Buddhism in India in reality. And what happening there then the, for the first time, they're realizing a gap between the Buddhism practiced in Japan, which is the Mahayana Buddhism and the Buddhism which is practiced, um, which is there in the, uh, in the place of origin. So this gives rise to a very controversial theory, which is Mahayana um, Nehi uh, Bhutsetsuron. He said Mahayana Buddhism is not what Buddha preached. It is a very corrupted um, Buddhism, which has come to us from China. So this starts off a, a huge search for fundamental Buddhism that is came a compound bukyo by Anesaki Masaharu, who later on became the founder of uh, the, uh, the Department of Religious Studies in Tokyo University, where I did my PhD. And he spent a lot of time in India. He, he, he actually in Banaras, he spent. Then uh, you have Nakamura Hajime, the Hughes who talks about Genshi Bukyo or original Buddhism. Then uh, there is Murakami Sencho who talks about like there is no distinct the Daijo book that Mahayana Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism are all later development. So what is we should have is Bukyo Toitsuron. There's only one Buddhism. Buddha didn't preach like Mahayana Buddhism and or, or Theravada Buddhism. He preached one Buddhism. 
So these are the various books that um, the Buddha no Kutoba, like what Genshi Bukyo Nakamura Hajime, and and this is also by um, the Kompon Bukyo to Daijo Bukyo. So these are the very um, the books which were very important for them because this was again the Buddhism. Uh, Japanese Buddhist scholars were relooking at their own Buddhist scriptures from the from their experience or from their study of Buddhism in India. So this was uh, so this was the rise of modern Buddhism in India. In, in Japan, which is called Kindai Bukkyo, Kindai Bukkyo Gaku, which is very important. And most of us, like we are from that uh, school, we study more post uh, Meiji Buddhism in Japan is also called Kindai Bukkyo. So uh, now, um, as I said, initially, all the scholars were not coming and studying in Japan, in India. They would come to India only for their for field work, for collecting scriptures. But the real study was going on in uh, in uh, in either in in their own universities in Japan or in Western universities. But gradually, we uh, we find in 1857, Calcutta University is established. For the first time, you have a modern university in in India. So then you have scholars like Yamagami Sogen, who, who was from the Soto Shu, who came to study Indology and Buddhism in Calcutta University. And why he's important is that he later on becomes the president of Komazawa University. So all these people who are coming to um, India to study, they all are going back and they're becoming great scholars in their own country. They are, they're becoming the founding fathers of, of Buddhist studies department or of, uh, Indian philosophy department in, their, in the Tokyo University, Kyoto University, all, all these places. The other is um, uh, Kimura Nichiaki, who was a person who actually went and stayed in Chittagong. And he, he, because he was interested in studying the Barua uh, community, the Barua Buddhists are the only surviving Buddhist community in India. And later on, he taught uh, in Calcutta. He also had very close relationship with uh, Tagore. So uh, by the time um, uh, we find that by the time we are approaching Second World War, you will be also having scholars like who are coming and studying in uh, Banaras University, Banaras Vidyapeet, or in Calcutta University, um, and in Pune University. In Delhi University, we find it is much later. It is actually after the Second World War, and when there is uh, this establishment of um, cultural ties, 1952, that the government starts promoting um, uh, academic exchanges, where you have uh, Takasaki Jikido, or Nara, uh, or Nara Sensei, uh, Nara Yoshiaki, or uh, Sengoku Sensei. They are all coming to from Tokyo universities or Buddhist. They are coming and and uh, teach or te they are they are studying in in Delhi. University and they're going back and becoming faculties in their own universities. Um, so this is how, uh, so that was the academic part. Now, another thing which Japanese Buddhists in India have been involved in, and that it has been the revival of Buddhism in India. So when they started coming to Japan and to India, they were all actually very disappointed. Because, for example, Nanjo Bunyo, he's so disappointed that he, he takes a vow, he will never come back to the country because there's no Buddhism left. There's no Buddhist left. So what happens is that they start uh, Buddhist revivalism or revival of Buddhism in India also becomes one of the major projects. And at that time, there was this uh, Sinhalese Buddhist called Dharmapala, Angarika Dharmapala, who, who, um, who was actually trying for the um, uh, restoration and, uh, and recovery of Buddhist form because they were all managed by the Hindu Mahans. So he wanted to take it back and take it, uh, take it back into the Buddhist fold. So he was actively supported by Shaku Kozin, who had gone to Sri Lanka to study Theravada Buddhism. And then he came back and he started supporting him. And he raised funds for his activities. He raised funds for him to go to the World Parliament of Religion in Chicago, along with Vivekananda. And, uh, and uh, um, what happens that, uh, and so in 19, uh, 1891, the first international Buddhist conference is, is held in Buddha Gaya. Uh, with uh, 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 with Shaku Kozen and other Buddhists um, uh, uh, supporting the and um, the Dharmapala, they have, they have, uh, they have their first uh, Buddhist conference is held. Then Dharmapala visits Japan four, four times. And the third time, uh, this Indo-Japanese association, Nichin um, uh, Kyokai, which is still there now, and it was established in 1903. Now, there is another uh, uh, Buddhist who is still there in, in India. His name is um, uh, so, Sasai Shude. 
his name is bhante ji nagarjun arya society student who is a naturalized he was a japanese who came in 1966 but he became a follower of ambedkar and he is now a leader of uh, um, dalit movement and based in nagpur and he is also pursuing the same um, um, uh, movement of recovering and restoration of buddhist sites from the hindus control of the hindu to the buddhist and particularly the mahabodhi temple which he wants it should be completely under the buddhist uh, thing so um what was happening there is that as buddhists were coming to india they were coming to a colonial india and most of them felt that uh, because japan was a successful colonizer and it was a colonial so they felt most of this felt that the decline of buddhism in india was actually responsible for india's colonization and so you have lot of anti western pan asianism um, um, uh, and buddhist revival movements in in colonial india and so one of the person there is fuji nitatsu who was a buddhist monk he comes and he meets gandhi and then he becomes a follower of gandhi and for from 1930 to 1938 he stays in with gandhi and he's he's actually his mission is to revive buddhism in india and also to um, uh, the, all the dilapidated buddhist sites he's, he was he gets involved in the restoration work so he writes some very important book like busse ke junkai the pilgrimage to buddha site setan kaikyo nishi accounts of preaching in in say in western paradigms then vardhaniki where he actually is uh, writes there it is his diary which is writing which i am actually trying to translate now and that is his <laughs> diary of... <laughs> hi hi so sorry so this is um, uh, um the uh, gandhi and this and this and they are very well known for establishing pagoda so now we have is that uh, in post war uh, era also we have this lot of this temple like in budga you have indosan uh, nipponji or, or daijokyo and but they are mostly motivated by uh, this uh, um, uh, by this world peace or international brother, brotherhood or supporting buddhist organization movements in japan so this is the which is a landmark in buddha gaya it is actually established for it is built by a, a japanese buddhist organization called daijokyo and this is in buddha gaya this is the nipponji or nippon terra so what is we are saying is that um, uh, while buddhism has been there now we find um, in in post uh, independence japan we find that uh, there's a new chapter in in, in buddhist diplomacy has started since 2014 as we know you know prime minister he's um, when he went there to japan on his first trip he went to a buddhist temples so one is that the second is the sambad or which is the round table meeting of um, um, religious leaders of both hindu and uh, buddhist religious leaders now it is very important which is uh, done by, which is uh, actually organized by indian buddhist conference and vivekananda international foundation and tokyo foundation of japan now the question arises is why uh, uh, japan has got involved in this uh, hindu buddhist conflict and the idea is that um, india wants to keep the buddhist discourse in its hand now while uh, in in last few, especially after xi jinping's uh, rule has started he's aggressively pursuing this buddhist diplomacy in south asia and southeast asia and particularly this great lumbini development plan in nepal where the, the railroad will come right up to uh, that um, will come till right up the lumbini means it's the it's almost coming to india border so the in the first uh, sambad what if you see the pm abe in his uh, video message he actually emphasizes on university talks about prince shotoku and vivekanand and talks about universality of dharma that is the traditional values of the indo pacific and open and um, free and open indo pacific and democratic region so on also it is there that japan is the only country after the britishers which has actually taken an interest in excavating and restoring buddhist sites in india i mean japan china has never bothered uh, it until very recently although they have a long history of association of it china with india but they have never gone into restoring or um, or excavating buddhist sites in india which the, as i said otani dankyu uh, otani expedition and all the people have done other buddhists have done so now, what we see is that like uh, so as we see now, now from buddhism from being an imagined country as the tenjuku now it has 
come into hardcore Buddhist diplomacy. And it is now, again, we see that it is one of the most enduring cultural linkages between India and Japan. Even when India Japan celebrates its 100 years of its relationship, if, I think if nothing else remains, what will, will, won't be there or something, but I think Buddhism will be there <laughs> to support. <laughs> because, because it you see, the whole, even when there was hardly any people to people contact, it was Buddhism which actually created the image of, uh, I mean, it actually the, created the imagination of and longing for India. And so what we now find is that whether it is monks, whether it's scholars, whether it's pilgrims, or whether it's tourists, or whether it's students, or whether it's diplomats, they all are agents of uh, Buddhist relationship between India and Japan. So what we see is that going to be a, it has a vast potential as a soft power, and and it has go, and where Japan has a very important role to play. Thank you. And this is a very famous poem by Ramla Tagore mm. on on Buddhism. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ranjan Mukhopadhyay. <clears throat> So uh, on the title, just you know, uh, from pilgrimage to diplomacy, just uh, just you know, maybe it it uh, stimulated uh, everyone's uh, you know interest. Just you know, what 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 is the diplomacy? And now just uh, you you showed us just you know, the potential as a soft power. Thank you very much. So uh, we have maybe. Uh, uh, five to 10 minutes left for maybe discussion or question and answer time. So anyone just who have questions to either uh, Professor George or Professor Anjana Mukhopatia, just please raise hands and uh, ask questions. I just have a question for Professor George. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is <laughs> what is the reason that uh, your vacancies are not filled? We have a lot, we are given a, a lot of other reasons, like, um, uh, you know, like they will restructure the course, so the specialization might change. So, but uh, I, I felt in your department, it's a, a literary, literature uh, or a cultural literature that is the field. So there could not be much of a change. So, um, I mean, so I, I'm, I'm amazed that even in uh, JNU that positions are not being filled because in, in India, in Delhi, in DU, it is a biggest problem. I mean, I have to teach so many papers because all the teachers are just retiring. There is no um, hiring of people. It's the main problem in JNU also. Replacement is not done because most of the open posts are now reserved. And in the third category, it is difficult for us to find out suitable candidate. That's one reason. Second is that because of COVID, you know, straight two years loss. Mm -hmm. You know, actually before the COVID, uh, some of the posts were scrutinized and shortlisted, but uh, no interview could be done because of COVID. And once the COVID came down, our vice chancellor was you know, his uh, term was over and uh, he was on extension. And when a VC is on extension, no recruitment is possible. So all these problems there in our case, CJS case, but for SES, uh, uh, sorry, CJS, this problem, for SIS, CES, I think uh, these posts are lying vacant for many years and mm -hmm. somehow they are not being filled. And uh, I feel pity because Japanese studies is, uh, Ria study is uh, suffering because of that. We are still six in CJS. Out of 13 posts, six are there. Rest are lying vacant, remember that. And the CJS, out of four or five posts, only one teacher is there, all other posts are lying vacant. So you just imagine what is the situation of uh, Japanese studies. Mm -hmm. uh, is so same way, I also have a reverse question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, Actually, uh, you know, your presentation was very uh, thought-provoking and uh, very informative. Uh, my question is that uh, when when did India or Indians come to know about Japan properly? Because uh, my reading says that only after the Meiji Restoration proper, 
you know, Indians uh, realize that there is a country called Japan. Uh, of course, people may be knowing in business and trade, they may be knowing, but uh, Japan was considered as a part of China. Even mm -hmm. now, when you see a Japanese, usually in villages, they ask, are you from China, not from Japan? Because any any record, historical record, that's what I want to say. Because they have Maybe. records from records from uh, 19 to uh, 1900 onwards, we can, they have records. Yeah, yeah. Prior to that. Actually, it is mostly, I would say, um, because um, uh, as you said, you know, even like uh, um, someone like um, uh, Fujini Tatsu, when he's going and staying in Vardha in 1930s, he's being referred to as a Chinese. Because he's in Vardha and everybody <laughs> in the records, in, in the ashram records, I've checked, he's been referred as a Chinese. Is an, and it was much later on that uh, they realized that uh, thing. I think it came, it came, Japan has come into the Indian subconsciousness only after Russo Japanese war. Yeah. I think it's the Russo Japanese war, which is 30, where, where most people are actually writing about Japan. No, and, no, uh, all... and that is, and for that, you know, it's, it's uh, like, it's some stray. I mean, you cannot even talk about, uh, I mean, it is there because it's industrializing and all this thing is there. But it's never, uh, I mean, uh, as you said, you know, I think, I think that there was never, uh, India didn't have to bother about uh, Japan because we were not getting anything from there. I mean, it was, it was never a sort of a cultural thing also coming to us. Because before that, you have Francis Xavier going to, if you look at the Christian history, Francis Xavier is going to Japan. So he somehow he has this, but of course, he's coming to know about Japan only in, in Hong Kong. And then he's going towards uh, Japan and he's coming back from Hong Kong, to, from Japan to, uh, uh, to Goa. But uh, somehow those records remain only within that um, uh, Jesuit uh, field. It is never disseminated wider about the, uh, although he's coming back, I think there's also a graveyard of his Japanese follower uh, in Goa. Uh, yeah. one, one seminarian, I think. One yes, Japanese yes. But, um, died, I mean, died, it's I never there in a popular uh, consciousness. And it's much uh, later, which is um, when Japan is coming in popular con um, consciousness. So it's mostly after Russo-Japanese war. That's mm -hmm. why I always say that the... Japan India relations in the ancient time, till the Meiji Restoration, we can say it was one sided. I always yeah, say yeah. it is one sided. Just mm -hmm. one -sided. Yeah. It is. Okay. <clears throat> Any question from the audience? Okay. So now maybe a time is coming. So maybe uh, let me conclude this session. So although the uh, time is very limited and uh, just we, we are missing uh, Fukunaga Sensei. And uh, so the topic uh, was chosen was quite limited also, but uh, we had a quite an interesting discussion and uh, we realized much more that, uh, you know, the specialist on Japan, Japanese studies, such as uh, Professor George or uh, Dr. Ranjana are quite, quite uh, highly, highly required in future generation also. So, and uh, more and more variety of uh, studies maybe should be promoted and uh, maybe dissemination of the knowledge uh, to Indian public, maybe uh, vice versa, maybe in, in Japan also just more and more Indian studies maybe should be promoted and uh, awareness just among the people should be promoted. So wishing for that, maybe let us conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Going back to the Jojin san Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, uh, Professor George and Professor Mukabadia for presenting um, an excellent uh, view on the cultural and civilization dimensions of India Japan study, India Japan relations, and as well as uh, Professor Dor for presenting an excellent overview of uh, Japanese studies in India.